The next item of business is topical questions, and at question number one, I call Carol Mockin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to comments by Prostate Cancer UK regarding reported figures showing that men in Scotland are more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer too late for it to be successfully treated than in other parts of the UK. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. We have uh, noted this Prostate Cancer UK research and we are discussing it with clinical experts right across uh, NHS Scotland. Staging prostate cancer is often uh, complex. And while Prostate Cancer UK's data from across the UK nation shows uh, apparent variation, uh, we are investigating this further. It is important that we understand the data, data in greater detail. I have asked my officials uh, in that vein to reach out to Prostate Cancer UK uh, for dialogue in this respect. Uh, when we compare survival rates, which is uh, arguably the most crucial measure for any patient, Scotland's five-year survival rates for prostate cancer is 84 0.3% and are very similar to other UK nations. Carol Mockin. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I think it's important that uh, we listen to the figures. The figure for individuals being diagnosed too late to be successfully treated in London is 12.5%. In Scotland, that figure is not far off three times as high at 35%. The Cabinet Secretary must accept that this is an extremely concerning gap, creating a picture that the Chief Executive of Prostate Cancer UK has called particularly shocking in Scotland. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept this Government's responsibility in addressing health inequalities in Scotland, that failures in this SNP Government are now leading to the unnecessary and avoidable loss of life? Cabinet so, so, so I don't accept the characterisation, partly because of the response that I gave to the first question that Karen Walken asks, and that is survivability rates. So she's asking about the impact of um, potential late diagnosis, and we know she's absolutely right. We know, of course, that late diagnosis can affect uh, the outcome uh, for somebody in relation to any cancer type, let alone how important it is in relation to prostate cancer. But when I look at those survivability rates, the five-year survivability rates, uh, Scotland's is 84.3. Uh, She's right, England's is slightly higher, 86.6. But we're not far off kilter uh, in relation to other uh, UK nations. We want to, of course, see improvements in that rate. And what I would say to Carol Walken, and where I agree with her, is there's no doubt of the link between inequality uh, whether that's inequality in relation to, 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 to uh, wealth inequality, socioeconomic inequality, that clearly also impacts health inequalities, and that's why we're focused on addressing the inequality gap. I should say I have good dialogue with Prostate Cancer uh, Scotland, uh, and uh, was at their March for Men uh, a number of months uh, ago. So I'll continue that dialogue with them, and we'll continue to invest in reducing the inequality gap that currently exists. Carol Mockin. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, I, you know, I, I laid out the figures, which are quite stark. Public Health Scotland data released in 2021 highlighted that, and, and I actually quote, there were convincing evidence that socioeconomic deprivation increased the likelihood of being diagnosed with more advanced cancers of the prostate. Indeed, in a further data published in 2022, there was a 10% fall in the number of people diagnosed with prostate cancer linked to underdiagnosed caused by the pandemic, of course. It is absolutely essential that the Scottish Government acts decisively to ensure men across the country are made aware of the options available to them in terms of tests, checks and online tools, which can both protect their own health and combat the impacts of health can inequalities. Can have a question, please? Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that he must take these figures seriously and make sure these uh, items are in place? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course we're taking those figures seriously. It's why I said in my opening uh, response to Carol Mockin that I've asked a variety of NHS experts uh, to, to, to give us some clinical advice uh, on that data. So we're not dismissing the figures by any stretch of the imagination. I hope nobody uh, has got that impression. Uh, what we want to do is understand the detail uh, greater. But where there's no argument between Carol Mockin uh, and I is that we know that inequalities uh, lead to uh, worse uh, health outcomes. And that's why 
our focus is on detecting cancer early and getting into those communities where we know there's inequality in areas of higher deprivation. She'll also know about the excellent work that we're doing in relation to rapid cancer diagnostic services, and she may have seen uh, the interim evaluation that was conducted, which shows that it's having uh, a, a, a more of an impact in areas of higher uh, deprivation. So we'll continue to invest. She knows that we're uh, rolling out another couple of uh, rapid cancer diagnostic services uh, across Scotland. So we'll continue to engage with Prostate Cancer UK. And in fact, in our new Detect Cancer Early public awareness campaign, which is uh, due to publish in spring of this year, uh, we're already in dialogue with Prostate Cancer UK to source case studies to support this campaign. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Um, research has shown that the burden of cancer is not felt equally across society, and the Cabinet Secretary has outlined that people living in more deprived areas are more likely to get cancer and are sadly more likely to die from the disease than folk living in less deprived areas. So can the Cabinet Secretary just reaffirm what steps that the Scottish Government has taken within its powers to tackle the root causes of poverty and associated health inequalities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I associate myself strongly with Emma Harper's uh, remarks, and uh, she's absolutely right. The government's uh, real uh, focus should be and is on trying to uh, deal with the problem at source, i.e., deal with uh, poverty and inequality that exists in our communities. So uh, we're targeting our actions to areas and communities most in need. Uh, seeing what more we can do. But we have, of course, provided uh, free school meals. We increased the number uh, of hours of free childcare. We've recently increased the Scottish child payment uh, to £25 per week. We've also supported 1.85 million households with council tax reduction. We've upgraded all benefits we deliver uh, by 6%, and we continue to deliver free prescriptions, concessionary travel, uh, and free uh, personal care. So we'll continue to do what we can to try to reduce poverty and inequality within the constraints uh, of the current devolution settlement. Jackson Carlow. Uh, being candid, can I admit to a significant uh, prostate cancer uh, concern uh, at the start of the pandemic, which had a bearing on decisions I made in my personal and professional life at the time? Uh, can I say that notwithstanding that, and notwithstanding the restrict constraints of the pandemic, the treatment I received was comprehensive, professional and timely. Uh, and I think it's important, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me, that the key thing is that for men who have any of the symptoms associated with prostate cancer, not to be concerned about any embarrassment that they may feel arising from that, but to present themselves to the health service at the earliest possible opportunity. By doing that, they can, like me, hopefully expect to survive safely. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I uh, uh, absolutely uh, applaud and I'm grateful to Jackson Carlow for sharing his own personal story. He doesn't owe that uh, to anybody, uh, but uh, by doing so, I hope uh, others who are listening uh, are hearing what Jackson Carlos had to say, uh, and that is why I made reference to the Detect Cancer Early programme and dialogue with Prostate UK. He's also right about the stigma around prostate cancer. Um, I was uh, at, at, at a, a men's group at, Maggie's, at the Maggie Centre in Edinburgh, uh, and the men's group there were saying actually that group uh, was a, a huge source of comfort uh, and relief and support uh, to, to, to them because they were able to talk about issues that were quite intimate uh, you know, make light of it in certain regards and, and, and have that uh, uh, conversation uh, with other men uh, that they felt that they couldn't have even with their partners or uh, let alone anybody else in their family. So Jackson Carl is absolutely right. Uh, what I go back to, and Jackson Carl will absolutely take this, I know, in the spirit that it's intended, um, uh, we, we really need to focus in, particularly in those areas of higher deprivation, because Jackson Carlo is He's well educated, he knows about these issues, he's been involved in politics for a long time. His public understanding of these issues, uh, I suspect, is very, very high. Uh, what we really need to do as a government is ensure that we focus in those areas of higher deprivation where we know that public awareness isn't there at the same level. So uh, that will be uh, our continued focus, but I end where I started in thanking Jackson Carlow for sharing his own experience and wish him all the very best in his health. Question number two, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I attach myself to the comments made by my colleague? very welcome recovery from our benches. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reported comments by the Chief Inspector of the Constabulary that some Police Scotland officers lack empathy and show outdated attitudes in domestic abuse cases. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, Police Scotland undertake excellent work in dealing with incidents of domestic abuse, but the recent HMICS reports and the comments around the victim experience highlights that more needs to be done. While operational matters, are, of course, are for the Chief Constable, we remain fully committed to using available resources to support the delivery of effective and responsive policing. 
and we are continuing to make changes to make it easier for people to report incidents and to perpetrators to be appropriately dealt with to help realise our vision of a Scotland as a place where women and girls live free of violence and abuse. Jamie Green. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary? More does need to be done because the police are the first point of contact in 85 per cent of domestic abuse cases. But the survey was quite clear around the overall perceptions people have on that experience. It was described as not very positive by 60 per cent of respondents to the survey. Uh, and many felt that the police had not provided the appropriate response to the initial reports. 50% worryingly said that they felt the police had not taken their complaint seriously at all. Uh, many victims also, and I think this should worry us, say that they had not bothered to report future cases of abuse because of that initial bad experience of reporting. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, given that, as he said, the lives of many vulnerable women are at risk in these situations, what discussions has he had with the Chief Inspector since the report produced these worrying findings? And given that the police are often doing the jobs of other emergency service workers and are already overstretched and overworked, what is this government doing to support them in their delivery of supporting domestic abuse victims? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first of all, I think uh, much of what uh, Jamie uh, Green says I would agree with. And I think uh, on the point he makes about the progress that's still to be made, I'm happy to um, acknowledge that point, as I think the police would do so as well. And on discussions with the Chief Constable, for example, I think he would uh, tell you that if you compared the response of the police the domestic abuse, when he started it was a constable compared to where we're at now, he would say there's been massive progress. Before it was a closed door beyond which the police didn't go. That has changed fundamentally. However, I acknowledge, and I think the police would acknowledge, the fact that there's a cultural issue to be dealt with here as well. They are in the process of dealing with that issue through training uh, and also the leadership that we've seen from uh, Fiona Taylor and the Chief Constable himself over a number of years. So that is the main thing that can be done uh, in this regard. And also, if, if we look at the 14 different recommendations made uh, by the inspector. I think these touch on issues which the police are very well aware of. They know they have to do more. Uh, and as to further discussions with the police, uh, whether chief constable or the senior officers, they will, they will happen uh, at the next meeting that we have with the chief constable, which should happen in the next two or three weeks. There is much interest, so concise questions and responses would be appreciated. Jamie Green. Thank you. Uh, the reality is, though, that over the last two years, we've witnessed the highest number of recorded domestic abuse incidents in Scotland since records began. And it's entirely unclear if that's a rise in reporting, a rise in cases or incidents or both. And that data is, is lacking uh, in this debate. It also uh, makes clear the vast uh, amounts of demand that it puts on our police. One victim said it took police two days to arrive after making a report. Uh, and another uh, waited two weeks before the police actually spoke to the abuser. Does the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Cabinet Secretary share my uh, genuine concerns that when victims of abuse need fast and empathetic responses to reports of domestic abuse, for far too many in Scotland, that clearly is not happening? And what is his message directly to those victims of these crimes, those who were brave enough to report that abuse, but have now simply and quite understandably lost faith in the system? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would say the, my response uh, to the victims is that we are aware of these shortcomings. The police are aware of these shortcomings. Uh, this research, this report by the uh, inspector is very important, as was last week's a report that came out around the early implementation of the DASA uh, regulations, which show that real progress has been made and people are more likely to report because of that new legislation, world-leading legislation. But we know we've got further to do. We've got the policies in place. We need to see further progress in dealing with these. And we'll do that. We'll continue to fund the police in order to make sure they're doing it. There was a reduction last year, I think, of 1%, if I'm correct. Uh, but we know that many instances are not reported. So we know that's the tip of the iceberg. And we'll continue to try and tackle it. Katie Clark. Has the Cabinet Secretary had the opportunity yet to look at the report published earlier this week by the University of Edinburgh, which reviewed the experiences of victims and witnesses in domestic abuse cases since the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018? It found that despite the legislation, domestic abuse victims still find the justice system traumatic. What further action does the Cabinet Secretary believe can be taken to reduce the trauma that domestic abuse survivors experience in the justice system? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, in addition, to, in addition to what I've laid out already, I think if you look at some of the recommendations which are made in this report, and I acknowledge the report that Katie Clark mentions, I think that was a report from last week. It's a small sample of around 69 people. It did say very good things about the introduction of the new legislation, but pointed out where else we had to go. But if you look at the recommendations, you can see what has to be done there to improve things. So, for example, making sure often the gender of interviewing officers is right for the victims is very important. And also making sure that those officers are trained in how to deal with domestic abuse uh, situations. And also, perhaps the biggest challenge is in relation to prevention. Very hard to deal with. But if we can get to the situation where prevention can happen, especially where it might be a repeat offender, then I think we'll make massive progress there. So I think between ourselves and the police and what's happening in the court service, where real uh, priority has been given during the recovery from the pandemic to deal with this, I think we can make further progress, and so we should. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The recommendations outlined in the HMICS report for Police Scotland suggest that Police Scotland's domestic abuse training should adopt a trauma-informed approach and or the lived experience of victims. Similarly, the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018 interim reporting requirements finds that increased training and understanding and more informed approach on domestic abuse by justice professionals could improve victims' experience of the criminal justice system. Therefore, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that a victim's entire journey throughout the justice system is person-centred, informed and responds to their needs? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's a very important point that uh, Pam Gosso uh, makes, and we have dealt with this through the Victims uh, Task Force, whereby we have said that all the different groups involved in this area have said that we have to have a justice system where every single part of it has undergone trauma-informed training to make sure that they have a trauma-informed response, I think, as Pam Gosso uh, mentioned. And that means every single person in the system has to have... I mean, I've done my training, such as it is so far, and I'm sure I'll do further training as well. But you're right to say, it, for the victim, it's the entire journey through the justice system. And if you've got one part of the system which is working very well, where everyone's very well trained and informed, and you get moved on to another part where that's not the case, then your experience is going to be a bad one. I'm not saying that's going to be done quickly as part of a justice vision, which will take years to make sure that we do that. But the biggest change that we can make within the justice vision is if we can get to that situation where the entire system is trauma-informed, person-centred, and it's a trauma-responsive uh, reaction that you get from the agencies, that's what we should be trying to achieve, and that's what we're setting out to do.